We move on now to the fourth study presentation here at the British Columbian Camp 1984, Sabbath afternoon, 3 o'clock. We'll now return to our study of the history of the Laodicean message and its application to our needs today. And I want now to examine just what the Laodicean message actually is. Let's turn again to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3 in which we have the account given by Christ through the Apostle John of just what it was. Now many folk think of course it's a message of stern denunciation. Let's read the words again. We start with verse um, 15. I know thy works, thou art neither cold nor hot, I would thou work cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and need nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eyes so that thou mayest see. The Laodicean message is not so much a message of condemnation as a message of offering. First of all, of course, the true witness recognises the church's need and points to the fact that above all else the church does not realise their true condition and then offers to that church three things, gold, white raiment and eye salve. Now I know that we're quite familiar, of course, with what those three symbols represent. First of all, what does the gold symbolise? the faith that works by love and purifies the soul the faith that works we recognize of course there are different levels of faith I like to make reference to the fact that Israel for instance came out, out of Egypt by faith you read that in, in Hebrews 11th chapter but their level of faith was sufficient only to tie them to God as their deliverer from temporal bondage and that's made very clear in the chapter in the book Patriarchs and Prophets entitled The Two Covenants. Let's just uh, briefly look at some statements in that chapter that help me make the point that there is faith and there is faith. <clears throat> that this people certainly did have one level of faith but they needed to uh, rise to a higher level still. Well, I find this book has got a different paging to what I'm used to, of course. Right, page 385. It talks about the Abrahamic covenant or the everlasting covenant, first of all. This is page 370, 371 in the true paging, of course. This is page 385 in this other edition. Now, on page 371 it is written, Another compact called in Egypt the Old Covenant was formed between God and Israel at Sinai, and it was then ratified by the blood of a sacrifice. The Abrahamic covenant was ratified by the blood of Christ and it is called the second or new covenant because the blood by which it was sealed was shed after the blood of the first covenant. That the new covenant was valid in the days of Abraham is evident from the fact that it is then confirmed both by the promise and by the oath of God the two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie. Now comes a question, a very vital question, but if the Abrahamic covenant contained the promise of redemption, why was another covenant formed at Sinai? And now the answer, in their bondage the people had to a great extent lost the knowledge of God and of the principles of the Abrahamic covenant. In delivering them from Egypt, God sought to reveal to them his power and his mercy that they might be led to love and trust him. He brought them down to the Red Sea, where pursued by the Egyptians, escape seemed impossible, that they might realize their utter helplessness, their need of divine aid, and then he wrought deliverance for them. Thus they were filled with love and gratitude to God, and with confidence in his power to help them. He had bound them to himself as their deliverer from temporal bondage. Now it's very important we recognize the level of faith to which they are brought by these experiences. It was a very real faith. 
as Paul says in Hebrews chapter 11, that by faith they left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. <clears throat> um, verse 29 of Hebrews 11, By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. So there's no question about the fact that it was by faith that the children of Israel passed through the Red Sea. But the level of faith which they attained did not connect them with God above his position as deliverer from temporal bondage. And it's worth our while to consider all the blessings Israel enjoyed with that level of faith because they made the mistake and we have to make the same mistake of accepting that those gifts as evidence that we are God's true children and are in a true born-again condition. Now, having made the statement, Sister White then goes on to say on page 372 of uh, Patriarchs and Prophets, or 371 probably, but there is a still greater truth to be impressed upon their minds. Living in the midst of idolatry and corruption, they had no true conception of the holiness of God, of the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, their utter inability in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a saviour. All this they must be taught. Now when they had no true concept of the holiness of God, nor knew the exceeding sinfulness of their own hearts, were unaware of their utter inability to, in themselves to render obedience and the need of a saviour, obviously they were not yet born again Christians. Not yet. And uh, in order to teach them this added lesson, to lift their faith to a higher and saving level in the spiritual realm, God brought them down to Mount Sinai. They gave them his law, they promised to obey, and when they found themselves breaking the, their own, the covenant they made with God, then they are prepared to receive the better covenant or the better promises based on better promises that would give them victory over sin. Now, let's summarize the list of gifts that the Israelites had before they came to Sinai, before they learnt this vital lesson, before they entered into the everlasting covenant. It becomes evident that they had the following things, not in any special order perhaps, but here's a list of them. Number one, they had divine leadership and protection. The pillar of cloud was there every day to guide them on their way toward the promised land. They could say at the end of every day, God has led us so far. They also had in their midst the spirit of prophecy in the person of Moses. They had a prophet, a living prophet amongst them, despite the fact they were an unregenerate people. And that should not be difficult to understand because the Adventist church, as a Laodicean church, destitute of the gold, the white raiment and the eye cell, also had a living prophet in their midst, did they not? Thirdly, we can say that they were given provision, their daily bread, uh, in the form of manna, and the water which followed them wherever they travelled across the desert, that living stream, in a land otherwise completely destitute of any kind of water supply. They had the written word of God as far as it was written, Moses having written the first books of the Bible, well, the book of Genesis at that time, and he's probably writing Exodus at, the, at, at that moment too, but uh, Moses wrote Genesis while he was in the mountains of Midian and that was their Bible back in those days. The rest was word of mouth handed down from the patriarchs. They had protection from their enemies and uh, they had the sacrificial system and naturally of course the human tendency was to conclude that being blessed of all those things was sure evidence that they had the full favour of God otherwise why did they have those things? But it's made very plain that uh, in all that God had succeeded in, in achieving no more than to bind them to himself as their deliverer from, deliverer from temporal bondage. And they still needed to learn the sinfulness of their own hearts, the holiness of God's character, their utter helplessness in themselves to render obedience to God's law and their need of a saviour. All that they who had the faith to cross the Red Sea and to walk under God's leadership day by day, all that they still had to learn. And so God brought them to Sinai. There they broke his law. And now I read on page uh, 372 these words. The terms, I be pardon, they could not hope for the favour of God through a covenant which they had broken. And now, 
seeing their sinfulness and their need of pardon, they were brought to feel their need of the, of the Saviour revealed in the Abrahamic covenant and shadowed forth in the sacrificial offerings. Now by faith and love they were bound to God as they delivered from the bondage of sin. Now they are prepared to appreciate the blessings of the new covenants. Now I read that to stress the point that when we read in Revelation chapter 3 about the gold that is spoken of here, that this is not merely the faith that gives us victory from temporal problems, but the faith which brings us deliverance from the power of sin. Now Sister White says it's the faith that works by love and purifies the soul and every word in the definition is very very important it's found in the book Christ Topic Lesson which I don't have with me today in the chapter I think entitled The Two Worshippers do you have it have handy? I wouldn't mind borrowing it thank you very much is this the right paging? it has in brackets oh, that's, that's always a little difficult but then I will try and see if we can find it you got a regular one? Oh, thank you very much <laughs> Pardon my preference, won't you? <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Very good. We'll just uh, check it out here. And um, every word in this definition I feel to be extremely important because it uh, defines what kind of faith is being spoken about and what kind of faith is necessary at this point of time. A person can have a strong faith in... Um, a person can have a strong faith in God's word, in the existence of God. A person can believe that a certain movement is the movement of God and be correct in that conclusion. A person can carry out all the functions of, uh, or the outward functions of religion and still be destitute of the goal that really works, or a faith that really works by love and purifies the soul. I read now on page 158 of the little book Christ Object Lessons, the Lord says, Because you say I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that you are wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eyes so that you may, that you may see. Revelation 3, 17 and 18. The gold tried in the fire is faith that works by love. Now this reference doesn't say what I thought it said um, and, and should, it doesn't add and purifies the soul. There is another statement which says that. I know there is. Only this can bring us into harmony with God. We may be active. We may do much work but without love, such love as dwelt in the heart of Christ, we can never be numbered with the family of heaven. Hmm. <clears throat> So we're talking now of this goal which is in fact the faith that works by love and purifies the soul. One thing we've stressed from the very beginning of this movement, from the awakening that uh, brought to us the new light of the power of God to save from sin, is that unless a message works, unless it does effectively produce in a person a transformation of character, unless the message literally gives us specific victory over sin, then how much value is it really? None at all. Now you can be sure, of course, that every theology in the world is going to produce some kind of improved modification of the man who accepts that message. Some improvement. This is true even of the Babylonian religions, even of the philosophies of Greece and Rome. They all had an effect for the better on the person who believed those theologies. But the change is outward and not inward. And that's why Sister Wallace led to write in the book Desire of Ages, page 172, I think it is, that um, the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, it's a new life altogether. Let's turn to um, page 172, no, it's page 174. In the, um, I beg your pardon, it's not either. It is 172. And this is a comment on a discourse between Christ and Nicodemus when um, Jesus said, That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. By nature the heart is evil, and who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean not one? No human invention can find a remedy for the sinning soul. The carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not 
subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. Romans 8 verse 7, Matthew 15 verse 19. The fountain of the heart must be purified before the streams can become pure. He who is trying to reach heaven by his own works is, in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. There is no safety for one who has merely a legal religion, a form of godliness. The Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a transformation of nature. There is a death to self and sin and a new life altogether. This change can be brought about only by the effectual working of the Holy Spirit. Now, when Sister White says the Christian's life is not a modification or improvement of the old, but a, but a transformation of nature, we ask the question, why did she choose to say that? Because she could have said it is not the life of a murderer, or a liar, or a thief, or, or any of those things which could have been listed in the, in, from the Ten Commandments. But that, that did not need to be said. Everyone understands that a Christian's life is not that of a murderer, a liar, a thief, and so forth. Everyone knows that. What is not so generally recognized is this, that the Christian's life is not a modified improvement of the old life. And therefore, with many people, the Christian life, uh, they think they do lead a Christian life when they have produced a modified improvement of the old. And this, of course, is one of the grand deceptions of uh, human history. To make the point, um, I'd like now to um, turn to Testaments to Ministers and read that famous statement, I say famous because so well known and so often used in the redis <coughs> rediscovery of the message taught by Wagner and Jones back in 1888. The statement found on page 91 and 2 of the book Testaments to Ministers, which I'm sure I've got here, don't I? Here it is. <coughs> And the statement reads, The Lord in his great and mercy sent a most precious message to his people through elders Wagner and Jones. It presented um, um, this message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Saviour, the sacrifice of the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety. Let me stop right there for a moment. Now that's the first thing in a list of three things that... Um, God sent through Wagner and Jones. The first was justification through faith in the surety. The second was it invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, it should become obvious to us that justification through faith is the goal and the obedience to God's commandments which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ is the white raiment. Then thirdly it goes on to say, many had lost sight of Jesus, they needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits and his changeless love for the human family. So Wagner and Jones brought justification through faith and assurity, the righteousness of Jesus Christ and spiritual discernment, which are of course the gold, the white raiment and the eye cell. So the religion that um, God sent through Wagner and Jones, the sister wife said, was the third angel's message in verity, the real thing. And the gold or the justification by faith in the surety was a message which brought the transforming power of God into the life of the individual and made them to be different people altogether. People within whom righteousness became the natural element in the place of the sinfulness which had been the natural element there before. Now, up until that time, if you'd walked amongst the Laodicean people, you would have been very impressed with their good works, their um, adherence to the law outwardly, they were given every appearance of being God's true people, careful Sabbath keepers and so forth and so on. And uh, one might say, well, we can't really see much difference between the Laodicean church's behaviour and what might be described as acceptable righteous, righteousness in God's sight. Where lies the difference between these two theologies? That is, the message of 1888 and Laodiceanism. But the Laodiceans knew there was a difference, and we know that because of their reaction to the preaching of Wagner and Jones. In fact, many people came to Sister White and said, uh, what are these men preaching? This is a strange new theology as far as we're concerned. 
You've never heard the like of this now lies before. What did she say? This is the third angel's message in verity. And what did the Laodiceans profess to believe? The third angel's message. They, they claimed to be the living exponents of it, the champions of it, the people who were teaching this in all the world. And yet when the real thing was brought to them, described by Sister White as the, as the, real, as the third angel's message in verity, and how did the regular Laodicean react to that? With hostility, with rejection, and the rejection was so serious that Wagner and Jones were finally forced right out of the church and the message was, was um, uh, quelled or put aside and forced to retire. So I'm very concerned today we do understand the dif difference between faith as such and the faith that works by love and purifies the soul because of the very vital difference between the two. Now, let's see if we can describe um, the difference between a modified improvement and a person in whom the gold, the white raiment and the eye self have been established. I'll just use a very simple illustration because I think we can identify with this illustration. Now, when I travel overseas, for instance, I ride in the big aircraft, jumbo jets and so on, to go from destination to destination. And to these days, a great deal of respect is paid to the non-smoker. He's protected these days from the smoker, which is very nice. I appreciate that, but I'm sure you folk would do, and do. And so in the aircraft washroom, there's always a sign which says, no smoking. In fact, I've seen an odd no smoking sign around here as well. Now, let's suppose now there are two different people go to the uh, aircraft washroom. I, I go there and uh, I, I don't even notice the sign particularly unless I'm looking for it and when I'm in the, in the aircraft washroom I do not smoke now why? because the sign said not to? not at all because I have no disposition to smoke and if you were there you wouldn't smoke for the same reason now along comes a man who's a practicing smoker, a heavy smoker he enters the aircraft washroom, he, has, he desires to light up but he sees the sign which says no smoking so he doesn't smoke either but why? because the sign says, thou shalt not. And so he doesn't smoke, not because he doesn't want to, but because the sign says, don't do it. And the sign implies, of course, if he does do it, he'll be punished quite severely for uh, breaking that law of his court. So, um, one person doesn't do it because, it, because he's nature not to do it, and the other person doesn't do it because the law says, thou shalt not do it. Now, which of the two is a modified improvement? The answer is obvious enough, isn't it? Now, in like manner, um, I've had the experience of uh, preaching the gospel in various parts of the world, and I read from Matthew chapter 5, where the Lord says, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, pray for them which despite for the usual and persecute you, and so on. And I've had people say, Yes, I know I should, but oh my, it's hard. I, I really want to hurt that person all I can, but I know I mustn't, so I, I love him. Does the person really love him? <laughs> Of course he doesn't, that's not real love by any manner of means. But the true Christian uh, has in him the very spirit of love, so it becomes his own natural disposition to love even his worst enemy. And um, he finds himself wanting to do his enemy good. It's, it's a spontaneous natural reaction from his inmost being. Now, do you suppose that you have to tell that kind of person that shall not kill your enemy? That's completely unnecessary. He, he will not kill his enemy, not because the Lord says thou shalt not do it, but because in him is no disposition to do it whatsoever. That person has received the goal which works by faith and purifies the soul. Let me stress again the important point that um, anything that doesn't work is of no value. If you were to buy an appliance, a machine, a car, a mechanical device of any kind and that thing did not work then what would you do with it? You'd take it right back to the person who sold it to you and demand a refund. And if there comes to you a religion which does not give you deliverance from sin, deliverance from hatred, pride, malice, bitterness, envy and all those things, if this religion doesn't solve your sin problem and make you to be a righteous person from within, it's not a working religion, what do you do? Send it back where it came from and ask for a refund. Don't you? Or shouldn't you? And I stand amazed at the, at the millions of people today who are following a, a different religions which do not give them spiritual satisfaction, which do not deliver them from their sin problems, 
I've had people openly confess to me that they're in the Romans 7 experience, they're sinning and confessing, sinning and confessing with the same sins over and over again, and yet they believe that in that condition they have salvation. And when you offer them something better, offer them a message which does bring deliverance from those problems, they repudiate that light as being the offering of the impossible. Whereas, of course, in the Word of God, we find that um, the Lord does promise us complete and total victory over every problem, over every sin, and many of us have experienced that, that, that wonderful power. Now, we could, of course, spend the rest of camping talking on faith and, and uh, demonstrating how faith works. I'd like to make a little further comment in this respect, though, and that is that um, how does faith actually work? And from time to time, people come to me who have read uh, Acceptable Confession, Bondage to Freedom, uh, Justified by Faith, and some of those little booklets, and they say, well, we, we believe what we've read. We can't deny the tremendous promises of God, such as Romans 6, verse 14, Sin shall not have dominion over you. As I read this morning from Testimonies, Volume 1, those um, extremely encouraging words about total and complete victory over sin. Let me just go back and uh, note those words again with you this morning, uh, this evening, this afternoon rather. Page 144 in volume 1 of the Testimonies. To him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and sat down on my father in his throne. We can overcome, yes, fully and entirely. Jesus died to make a way of escape for us that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation and sit down at last with him. Right, so there's the promise that we might overcome every evil temper, every sin, every temptation and sit down at last with Jesus Christ in the kingdom above. And um, this victory, however, is not the control and suppression of the old nature. This victory is the replacing of the old nature by a new life force altogether, a life force which uh, puts good into the place where evil previously was, so that our new disposition is one that responds to God's spirit and not works against him. Now, people then have come before God, they have made an acceptable confession in which they have confessed not just what they have done but what they are, they have claimed God's cleansing power, but to their dismay, when they go out into the battlefield again, they find that Satan comes and within themselves they feel a regeneration of all the evil symptoms which were there before. I ask this question from time to time, not by everybody, but by an odd person now and again. And um, it seems to me as if the problem lies in the failure to really claim the victory in the hour of need as we read in page 200, that um, the victory or the gift we realize when we need it most because we already possess it at this point of time. I've always appreciated the power found in the words in Desire of Ages, page 490, a chapter which talks about the victory over Satan in the last journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And here Sister White says, Beyond the cross of Calvary with, with its agony and shame, Jesus looked forward to the great final day when the prince of the power of the air will meet his destruction on the earth so long marred by his rebellion. Jesus beheld the work of evil forever ended and the peace of God filling heaven and earth. Henceforward, Christ's followers are to look upon Satan as a conquered foe, not as a foe to be conquered. Now, of course, Satan doesn't want you to believe that and he does, does his very best to convince you he's anything but a conquered foe. Let's go a little further Upon the cross, Jesus was to gain the victory for them, that victory he desired them to accept as their own. Behold, he said, I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit is a defense of every contrite soul. Not one that in penitence and faith has claimed his protection will Christ permit to pass under the enemy's power. The Saviour is by the side of his tempted and tried ones. With him there can be no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility or defeat. We can do all things through Christ which strengthens us. <clears throat> Come back now to the main thought in this little reading. Christ's followers are to look, look upon Satan as a conquered foe, not as a foe to be conquered. 
Therefore, a Christian never goes out to get the victory over sin. Never. The Christian gets the victory as a personal gift from Jesus Christ, fresh every single morning, and goes out with that victory to meet the foe. Now, even though he goes out full of faith and strong in the realization that he has that victory, Satan is able to simulate, I believe, in him all the evidences that the sin has not been cleansed away from him, that he still has the same evil disposition within himself. And I have found that the secret to um, maintain the victorious experience is this. First of all, having made your commitment with God and to the correct procedures being delivered from the sinful presence within, you then go out in possession of the victory to meet a conquered foe so there's no chance of defeat whatsoever. But when you meet him, somehow he's able to make it appear that within yourself the old disposition still exists. At least in some people. I've had, I've had the problem myself on, on at least one occasion. And um, when that time comes, it is critically important for you to disregard the witness of, of, of feelings, the witness of circumstances, and simply say to the devil, Look, I've settled this whole matter with God. I've given into his hands my sinfulness. I've received into myself his righteousness. And the whole question now is no longer my problem. If you wish to discuss with me my previous sinfulness or my supposed sinfulness now, you go and talk to Jesus Christ about it. And when you resist Satan in that fashion, what does he do? He flees. And believe me, he does. Absolutely does. But if you have that, I wonder if it's going to work attitude and you kind of have a, a, an uncertainty in your a, a wait and see attitude, then you can absolutely rely upon the fact that you will fall under temptation. Satan will have the power over you and you will go back into sin one more time. Fortunately, of course, you can learn by the sad mistake and do better next time, hopefully at least. So the Christian never remembers then and, and rests his faith in the simple fact that Satan is a foe not to be conquered, but is a foe already conquered. Now, this also demonstrates the fact that victory is not the suppression of the old evil dispositions. Victory is the presence within yourself, the presence, oh, let me say it again, within yourself of the actual life and nature of Jesus Christ. Now, if, for instance, you go out and uh, the hour of temptation comes and you find bad feelings and wrong dispositions welling up and demanding activity and uh, fulfillment, and you go to war against that by trying to control those things and deny them and push them back where they came from, then you are not fighting, uh, you're fighting but not a conquered foe. You're fighting a very living foe and even though you may succeed for time to gain control over your evil disposition, what is going to happen in the end? It will break out for certain. And the only solution of course is to be freed from its presence by the cleansing power of God as we have many promises to confirm that we can be. So then, <clears throat> this goal that works, this faith that works by love and purifies the soul is the first ingredient needed so badly by the Laodicean church. It is justification by faith in the surety. And we recognise today, of course, there are a number of different schools of thought in the Adventist world saying that this is justification by faith or that is justification by faith or this other thing is justification by faith. And most of them, of course, are theologies which um, leave the sinful presence within the person. It's claimed that no one can be delivered from that sinful presence until Jesus comes again. In the meantime, we have to live with a tiger, as uh, one writer wrote in his little book, uh, on just, no, that's the title, actually, Living with a Tiger. What was his name again? Um, Heaven Oh, Vanderman. Vanderman, right, Vanderman, yes. He wrote the book Living with a Tiger, and the argument throughout the book is, of course, that um, you have the new nature and the old nature fighting against each other, and this bitter battle goes on until the second coming of Jesus Christ, when at last we are purified from his presence and given a place in the heavenly kingdom. A position not supported by the spirit of prophecy, which makes it very plain that when Jesus comes again, there will be no cleansing away from sin, that that must all be accomplished before that time. Let me just see if I can quickly find the statement in volume 3 where Sister White makes that point very, very strongly and clearly that those who are resting in the thought 
that when the second coming of Christ uh, takes place, it'll be cleansed. The evil natures are resting on very much a false hope. And this, of course, is uh, absolutely true. We are living today in the time of um, cleansing, and any, any work of cleansing not accomplished during the present period will not be accomplished when Jesus comes again. Um... I just don't see the... Uh, no. I can't quickly find them, sorry, but... Um, I know it's in volume uh, three. Just a minute. I haven't got the reference, I'm sorry at the moment. I'll look it up and read it to you possibly in the next study period. So we save time at the moment, but um, it's made very plain in that particular volume that um, that, is the, that is the case. That anybody who has not effectively gained deliverance from the presence of sinfulness at the present time has no hope of that being done when Jesus Christ comes again. All this must be accomplished in these hours of probation. If not done then, it's very, very much too late when the Saviour appears again in the clouds of heaven. So I'll look it up a little later, I'm sorry, I'm going to write right now for you. Good, now let's move on to the white raiments. 2T355. Oh, it's volume 2, is it? Thank you very much. Um, I suspect I had the wrong testimony. Page again, 355. That's the one, thank you very much. The chapter is called Christian Temperance. Now read the paragraph, page 355 in the book, volume 2 of the Testimonies, and these are very, very plain words. We believe without a doubt that Christ is soon coming. This is not a fable to us. It is a reality. We have no doubt. Neither have we had a doubt for years that the doctrines we hold today are present truth and that we are nearing the, the judgment. We are preparing to meet him who escorted by a retinue of holy angels is to appear in the clouds of heaven to give the faithful and the just the finishing touch of immortality when he comes he is not to cleanse us of our sins to remove us the defects in our characters or to cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and dispositions if wrought for us at all this work will all be accomplished before that time now those words are too plain to, misunder to be misunderstood aren't they let me just note the main point again. When he comes, he is not to cleanse us of our sins, to remove us the defects in our characters, or to cure us of the infirmities of our tempers and disposition. Christ does not come to do that. The next sentence says, If wrought for us at all, the work will all be accomplished before that time. When the Lord comes, those who are holy will be holy still. Those who have preserved their bodies and spirits in holiness, in sanctification and honour, will then receive the finishing touch of immortality. But those who are unjust, unsanctified and filthy will remain so forever. No work will then be done for them to remove their defects and give them a holy character. The refiner does not then sit to pursue his refining process and remove their sins and their corruption. This is all to be done in these hours of probation. It is now that this work is to be accomplished. Now, I, I really couldn't ask for a plain statement to make the point on that one. So this is what I emphasise with italics, that it is now that this work is to be accomplished for us. Now, what work? The work of refining and purifying our characters and so forth. The work of removing from us our defects of character, our unholy tempers and, and uh, unsanctified hearts. So that when we come to the day of Christ's return will have to then be holy because he who is then holy will remain holy while he who is unholy of course will also remain such forever let's move on now to the white raiment I want to demonstrate of course that the message given by Wagner and Jones in 1888 was in fact the message of the to the Laodicean church so the council is that, that uh, we are to to buy white raiment that we might be clothed. Now we all understand that the white raiment is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. There's a very fine statement to this effect in Testimonies Volume 4, page uh, 88, Volume 4, page 88, which I will proceed to read now, to demonstrate that uh, Sister White gave these definitions to these symbols. 
Faith and love are the true riches, the pure gold which the true witness counsels the lukewarm to buy. However rich we may be in earthly treasure, all our wealth will not enable us to buy the precious remedies that cure the, the, the disease of the soul called lukewarmness. Intellect and earthly riches were powerless to remove the defects of the latter sin church, or to remedy their deplorable condition. They were blind, yet they felt that they were well off. The Spirit of God did not illumine their minds, and they did not perceive their sinfulness, therefore they did not feel the necessity of help. To be without the grace of the Spirit of God is sad indeed, but it is more terrible, is a more terrible condition to be thus destitute of spirituality and of Christ, and yet try to justify ourselves by telling those who are, who are alarmed for us that we need not their fears and pity. Faithful is the power of self-deception, I mean fearful is the power of self-deception on the human mind. What blindness, setting light for darkness and darkness for light. The true witness counsels us to buy of him gold tried in the fire, white ram and an eye cell. The gold here recommended as having been tried in the fire is faith and love. It makes the heart rich, for it has been purged until it is pure, and the more it is tested the more brilliant its luster. The white ram is purity of character, the righteousness of Christ imparted to the sinner. I'd like to pause there for a moment before we go on to note exactly what these words say and uh, therefore to understand them. The white ram is purity of character, the righteousness of Christ imparted to the sinner. Now we understand there's imputed righteousness and imparted righteousness. And imputed is something which is credited to our account, but what about imparted? It's given to us, isn't it? So when we are given purity of character, then what do we have? Purity of character. It's not something which is vicarious or put on, it's something which is actually there. I read on. This is indeed a garment of heavenly texture that can be bought only of Christ for a life of willing obedience. The eye self is that wisdom and grace which enables us to discern between the evil and the good and to detect sin under any guise. God has given his church eyes which he requires him to anoint with wisdom that they may clearly see. But many would put out the eyes of the church if they could, for they would not have their deeds come to the light, lest they should be reproved. The divine eye cell will impart clearness to the understanding. Christ is the depository of all graces, he says, by of me. Some may say it is exalting our own merits to expect favour from God through our good works. True, we cannot buy one victory with our good works, yet we can't be victors without them. The purchase which God recommends to us is only complying with the conditions he has given us. True grace, which is of an estimable value and which will endure the test of trial and adversity, is only obtained through faith and humble, prayerful obedience. Grace that, en grace that endure the proofs of affliction and the persecution and evidence their soundness and sincerity are the goal which is tried in the fire and found genuine. Christ offers to sell this precious treasure to man, buy of me gold tried in the fire. The dead, heartless performance of duty does not make us Christians. We must get out of a lukewarm condition and experience a true conversion if we should or we shall fail of heaven. Page 88 and 9 in the book uh, Testimonies Volume 4. Well, we'll leave it there as our time is gone and we'll pick up this same thought and move on in our next study period and we'll meet again, shall we say, at uh, 4 o'clock, which is just uh, almost 15 minutes from now.